All right. Hi, everyone. Happy Friday, and welcome to the Henry Schein Dental Academy webinar series. My name is Adam, marketing specialist, and I'll be your moderator. We are excited to welcome Diane Peterson as our speaker today, as she will give us the answer to the question your patients keep asking you about. Why do I keep getting cavities? Before we get started, we have a few reminders for you. At any point during today's webinar, we do encourage your participation through the chat and Q&A features. Please type any questions you might have into the Q&A section of your control panel, and we will answer them live at the end of the presentation. Henry Schein is not offering CE credit for viewing or attending this presentation live or on demand, and this webinar is sponsored by Colgate. Diane, welcome, and thanks for being with us today. I have to ask, why do people keep getting cavities? Well, thank you, Adam. That's a very good question, and I hope I, by the end of this presentation today, we'll have at least some answers or some ways that we can make recommendations to our patients to help them. So um, I, this title really spoke to me when I was putting this presentation together because of my years in clinical practice and patients coming in, even though we think we're doing the best we possibly can, you know, they'd say, why do I keep getting cavities? And the thing is, we kind of know what we're doing in the office, but we don't always know what they're doing at home. And we always hope that they follow through with any of our recommendations. But it's not always easy to know that. So today, what we're gonna talk a little bit about is we're just gonna kind of kind of get a little bit of an update of what's happening with caries. We're gonna talk um, a little bit about the caries balance and caries risk assessment. And then we're gonna look at a little bit of the science and some of the evidence out there now, the current science about what should we be doing for our patients in terms of caries at risk management. And then we'll do a review of what's on the market today. What can we use? What can we recommend our patients? So is caries still a problem? So it's interesting to note that really 99% of care, you know, caries are preventable 99% of the time. And we still have this problem. It's still definitely something that we're seeing in our practice. And I think even now um, that we're even mostly in isolation and COVID is still here, I think people's diets are not great. Um, I think we're eating differently because we're home. And also we need to think about our patient population because even you know, as early as children, if they start getting caries, we know that through the lifespan, that's always gonna be an issue for them and that they're gonna need to manage that condition. So when we think about that caries process, you know, we know that there is an acid attack. We know the demineralization and remineralization process. And so really our struggle is how do we keep our patient in remineralization longer and less time in demineralization? And when you think about this caries process and going back to that thought that, you know, we're eating differently now. We're not just, you know, eating breakfast, lunch, and dinner. We're definitely more of a grazing um, population, we might get up and have our coffee in the morning, and then we have our um, bagel or whatever. And so we're constantly, you know, really dropping the pH in our mouth. We're having repeated ex sugar exposures, and we really don't allow for total repair of the enamel for having all those, you know, drops in our pH throughout the day. So what is the consequences of this caries activity? Well, we know that caries reversal, reversal is really dependent on balancing that demineralization or remineralization stages. And we know that we really, if we spend too much time in demineralization, our patients are gonna have re loss of enamel, um, that subsurface is going to start to cavitate. And we really want to think about, you know, how, what can we do? How can we some kind of, have some kind of intervention and at what point to really help our patients spend less time in demineralization and more time in remineralizing. So this takes me to probably something you've heard about for the last, probably I'm gonna say 15 to 20 years is caries managed by risk assessment. And the reason I bring this up is I think that we all kind of do it, if not formally, I know we do it in our head and we can kind of pinpoint those patients that you know, we know are high risk. Let's say our patient comes in and has four or five different uh, medications they're on that you know, three or four of them have a side effect of xerostomia. Those patients right away we know are gonna be at high risk for, for caries. But the one thing that might be missing to that is that we really haven't um, quantified the disease for our patients. 
And when I think of risk assessment, it really, to me, gives that patient a little bit more ownership of their condition because suddenly they're having to write something down. They were having, we're quantifying their disease for them. So what is caries management or risk assessment? Well, we, it considers caries an infectious disease, which, you know, I would say, because I've been doing this a long time, you know, we didn't know that much about it 40 years ago about, you know, you were under the assumption if I had a, a cavity filled, a carious lesion filled, I was under the inception that I was caries free. We know that's not true anymore. And also the thing about risk assessment is we kind of kind of get an idea of where a patient falls in the position of the caries balance. And we'll talk about that a little bit further along here and, and what we can do to keep them in balance. And then really take into account what are their risks? What are the interventions that we can do to help minimize their risk? And are there things, what we call kind of a friend of mine calls low hanging fruit, are there simple preventive and therapeutic approaches that we can use to kind of based on that risk to help them? And then for me, it's really monitoring the outcomes. So many times we make recommendations to our patients, but how do we know if they work? If we really don't monitor the outcome, or have some way to measure the outcome, it's really difficult to say, yes, this really does work. I mean, the science is out there, but we also really need to think, is this working? And if not, what are we gonna do differently the next time? And also it really takes into account that we can then use, what are some of the evidence-based treatment interventions now that we can use? They're really focusing on returning that patient back to a healthy balance based on their risk assessment. So it's a little bit more than just saying, here's your risk. It really gives us the opportunity to step back and say, okay, what can we do? And, and I always like to say to monitor the patient. It reminds me of a story when I was first um, out of school and there was a dental office in our community that everyone wanted to work at. And they happened to have one day a week open. And I was very excited to go in. And I remember that the dentist that, you know, I was very young and eager and I was doing an exam and I'm like, oh, there's some pretty obvious can for a new graduate. I thought, oh, that this patient definitely, you know, has some carious lesions. And this particular dentist says to me, we're going to after looking, he goes, no, we're going to monitor it. And what was interesting to me even then is monitor. I kept thinking to myself, monitor it to do what? If we didn't provide an intervention, what was going to happen? And what was interesting is that over time, I realized that that was just, you know, wait till it gets bigger. But I also knew that at that time, if you don't provide an intervention, then you really are not really helping the patient. You have to, if you want to monitor it, there has to be some kind of next step. Um, I, I just wanted to include the, the uh, carries risk assessment code there, just so you know, it can be, um, Code. So important to, you know, if you are doing a risk assessment, whether it gets reimbursed by um, the patient's dental benefits or not, it's always important to code it so that it shows that you've documented that you have done a risk assessment. So as we look at this, this is um, back from Dr. Featherstone. This was back in 2007. So when I say like quite a few years ago, I mean it quite about 15 or 20 years ago. So the carries imbalance for me, when I look at this, it really shows me that with that pivot point, what this is saying to me is, you know what, a patient has, there's lots of disease indicators, there's so many risk factors in terms of caries, but really, do we don't have that many protective factors available to us. So in terms of what we have is, we have to rely very heavily on those protective factors and really put a lot of weight on them to get that patient back into balance. So when you think about those disease indicators, you and I both know that, you know, I love this because it's like green means go, yellow caution, and red means stop. So whenever we see any restorations, you know, we need to stop and think, okay, how, you know, how many, to, you know, what was their last visit? Has it been, you know, are they getting carious lesions every single time? What am I going to do differently if we, we need to stop that kind of the train from rolling? Um, and what are their risk factors? So do they have, obviously, if they have um, disease indicators, they definitely already have the bacteria that causes caries. What is their saliva content? What is, do they have saliva? 
You know, do they have enough? Do they need a salivary stimulant? Do they need a salivary substitute? What's what do they have? And what is their diet like? I mean, I think a lot of times we it it's, ends up being a, a kind of a you know one question after another because you really have to dive deep. So sometimes we don't always know. You know, are they telling the truth about their diet? What is their diet like? And so some of those things, and quite honestly, the diet is probably the hardest thing for us to impact because usually people don't change their diet that easily. And then we look at the protective factor. So saliva, you know, saliva is our friend. It is so great in terms of, you know, antibacterial properties, moisture um, and protective factors. And still today, sealants are a great um, adjunct preventive um, treatment for caries. We're going to talk a little bit. We'll talk briefly about some antibacterial um, therapies. We're really going to kind of work heavily on fluoride because I think fluoride is not nest is such a great therapeutic agent. But I also think that you know when we learned back it way many years ago, it it really doesn't get the weight it should in terms of you know the use, how much, what is how much patient fluoride is your patient getting, et cetera. And then a little bit about effective diet. So when we think about um, our treatment plan, and this is an example, this is the ADA's um, uh, carries risk assessment. And there's many out there and whatever works for you is, you know, as long as you're using it is great. But like I said, I really like this one because it kind of, even for the patient who's filling this up, I love the green, yellow, red, because it speaks to, you know what? As soon as you get into the high risk, the red, even the patient's going to know, wow, this is not good. Something's not, you know, I definitely have too many things on the red and not enough on the green or the yellow. So with this, you can really base your treatment plan and manage your, your patient's carries progression by just filling out a simple form. Really puts them in and kind of, like I say, quantifies their disease, but also gives it a little them a little bit of ownership. To the disease. So for many people, sometimes we'll say, you know, we might recommend a treatment when it's going to help them with their caries. And I'm like, my first thought is help it do what? I mean, I really need to know what is it going to do? Is there some science behind why we're doing that, etc. So really just kind of, you know, looking at this too, is that once you're even in your practice, you know, if a patient's low risk, you should have a pretty set um, protocol as to do they need extra fluoride? What else are we going to be doing? Do they just need brushing, flossing, maybe a fluoride rinse? Uh, if they're moderate risk, do you have anything in place to say that based on your risk, on moderate risk, what am I going to be providing my patient? What kind of therapies will I be recommending based on that moderate risk? And then once you get into the high risk, and, and as we know, these patients in terms of caries management, it really is difficult. It's very complex, but is there some kind of protocol in place that said, okay, based on them being high risk, these are the things that I'm going to recommend and make sure my patient gets so that that, you know, restorations that I've been doing, those extensive, you know, crown and bridge, et cetera, if we're doing any of that on these patients, that we want them to be successful. We want them to be able to protect their investment. And so in terms of documentation and really giving that patient a visual as to where they fall on this scale and then making that recommendation so that they can move themselves um, kind of into more balance in terms of caries risk. So let's look a little bit at the role of fluoride and caries management today. So we know it really does help with the immunization enhancement. And basically what we're doing here is we're providing with topical fluoride, we are providing a fluoride reservoir so that every time there is an acidic challenge and that hydroxyapatite crystals from the enamel start to demineralize, that there is fluoride available to be taken up and to form fluoroapatite crystals. And we know that those crystals, those fluoroapatite crystals are more enamel resistant to acid. So you're making it stronger. They're more resistant to the acid. So we're really making the two stronger. And then it's going to take a bigger acidic challenge to begin the demineralization process. 
And I know a lot of this is review, but I also want to, to show this slide because whenever I do presentations, this seems to be one that really speaks to people because, you know, how much fluoride is in a product? And it's sometimes hard to kind of like remember and navigate all this. So this kind of uses the, the salt packet kind of from maybe like a Panera or something. So um, we do know that many communities still have fluoridated water, which is great. I live in Vermont and about every two years, there's some anti-fluoridation activity in my community and the dental professional has to go out and speak to it because we're probably one of the biggest anti-fluoride areas. But, you know, it used to be at one part per million. It's now down to 0.7 parts per million. So basically, that's like one granular of salt in a million parts of water. And then if you're recommending, if you go and you talk to your patient and they're saying they're using an over-the-counter uh, fluoride rinse. So there's about 200 parts to 230 parts per million of fluoride in an over-the-counter rinse. And that's like a quarter of a salt packet. And that's the most amount of fluoride that you can have in over-the-counter rinses. Um, and that's regulated by the FDA because you really don't, you know, you, you don't want to have to worry about ingestion, et cetera. So in terms of caries reduction, if used as directed, it's, you know, when we're looking at decayed missing filled surfaces, it's about a 26% reduction if they're using it um, properly every day. The next is a prescription rinse. And this is Prevident rinse. This is um, any, any rinses that are over 200 to 230 have to be prescription in the United States. So this is 900 parts per million. And this is a once a week rinse. And this is about three quarters of a salt packet in a million parts of water. And we'll get into details about some of these later. And then if your patient is using an over-the-counter toothpaste. So in the United States, patient can have it can have anywhere between a um, 1,000 parts per million and 1,500 parts per million. And that's about one salt packet in a million parts of water. And if you look at the research on toothpaste that's been done, and there's been, I think um, the Cochrane Review looked at this, and there were about 70 um, different long-term studies on this. And, and the average caries reduction was between 24 and 27% in caries. But we have to look at how the patient uses it. So in most instances, our patients, we like to think that they brush twice a day and that they, you know, brush for two minutes and they floss. And But the reality is they brush on average once a day for about 40 seconds. So even though it says 24 to 27%, they're probably not getting the full benefit of it because they're not brushing long enough or often enough during the day. And then we get into our the prescription fluoride. So this is a 5,000 parts per million of fluoride, like our Prevident 5,000. So it's like five salt packets in a million parts of water. And then when you get into the varnish, that's a like 22,600 parts per million of fluoride. So that, I always call this like the Cadillac of fluoride. So what we're doing is, what we're trying to do is trying to keep enough fluoride available. So whenever there's an acidic challenge, there is a bolus of fluoride in that reservoir to be taken up. So if you look at the varnish, the nice thing about varnish is it's, you know, it's deposited, it's there. Um, I know there's still quite a bit of, of discussion about how long, you know, does the varnish last? And, you know, we like to think it lasts at least three months, some say six months. In actuality, a lot of it has to depend, depends on how many acidic challenges the patient has, how many times they've gone into that demineralization, and it does get taken up that fluoride ion. So it's kind of a case of how much fluoride, how much topical fluoride do we want to be available to be taken up based on the patient's risk. So, and then this kind of speaks to, you know, what's over the counter, which is prescription, what I said before, over the counter, they contain about 1,000 to 1,500 on average, it's 1,100 parts per million. And we also know that anything greater in the US than 2,500 parts per million, um, and the most is 5,000 is prescription. Um, and I will say that I live close to the Canadian border, probably two hours from Montreal. And actually what's nice is prevalent is over the counter there, which is really kind of a, a treat compared to what we have here. So let's kind of now look at, so we've kind of looked at, you know, we just a quick review of is caries a problem? Um, our patients are getting cavities. What are we doing for them? 
Um, we know that the fluoride is available, but let's look at the science. What is the science saying we should be doing in practice in terms of um, kind of pre what are we recommending? What kind of treatment are we providing for our patients in terms of caries risk? So the first is if you go to the ADA um, site on under evidence space, they've got some really great resources for you. And this one I think is great because you can print it, laminate it, have it in your office. And it really kind of breaks down, you know, what should we be doing in office in terms of topical fluoride? Where's the evidence? So based on their risk and their age group, are they low, moderate, or high risk? And what is their age? What should you be doing? How often should you be doing some kind of um, topical fluoride treatment? And if you look at this, really what we're seeing is varnish is, is definitely considered the, the first line of defense here. You know, whether it's every six months, three months, depending on how often you see them, it's very important that we are applying some kind of um, in the moderate to high risk range that we are doing some kind of in office fluoride treatment. Um, a couple things that they did point out, which I thought was really um, nice to kind of talk about the application time for fluoride gels and foams, because I know some offices still use a fluoride gel or a foam. It really should be four minutes. And the other thing is measuring that gel or foam. The hard part about foam is it's really hard to measure. With the gel, you should have a five mil dosage. And it's important to remember that the dosage is to make sure that that patient is getting the uh, adequate amount of fluoride to get the certain amount of caries reduction. So it just talks about some of the evidence and really, you know, what should you be doing on a daily base, uh, basis with your patients? So the next is the American College of Prosthodontics. So um, it's really kind of, if you're treating patients with any kind of um, fixed bridge or crowns, this was a systematic review that was really looked at um, what should you do for um, tooth-borne restorations, and what they came up with, and when we think about clinical practice guidelines, what I like to mention is this is really, you know, they've looked at all the science, they've looked at all the research, and they've really pulled out the best research and science to say this is what we consider a good clinical practice guideline. This is something that will guide what we do on a daily basis. So what they talked about is they really, you know, looked at patient recall. They looked at you know, what should you do in office in terms of professional maintenance? What are some of the guidelines for removal and fixed restorations? And what are the at-home maintenance guidelines? And what they came up with is if you were looking at tooth porn, so if any of you are doing any kind of crown and brick, et cetera, is they really recommended a toothpaste with 5,000 parts per million fluoride for home care. So there was that, there's a quite a bit of science, and we'll go over that a little bit later, about the 5,000 parts per million, especially when we talk about the, um, you know, really maintaining that, that restoration, having a long life. Um, when I was uh, working in clinical practice, every one of my patients who had left with either crown or bridge left with a 5,000 part per million of fluoride. That was part of their first, you know, as they left, because we really knew that it was super important. We didn't want recurrent caries around those, those restorations. And it really was a way to show the patient that was a strong recommendation that in order to maintain that restoration, this is what they needed to do. And then we look at um, the ADA came out in November of 2018, and they really um, looked at what are some of the clinical practice guidelines for the non-restorative treatment of caries. So they've done guidelines on restoring caries and what you should do, but this is really like giving you permission to do a risk assessment and monitor. So as we know that if we have seen that we can remineralize if they're non-cavitated lesions, if we get fluoride in there early enough, we can remineralize those lesions. And it really gives you permission to do this. So their recommendations based on these non-clinical, non-treatment is always doing a varnish on these patients, um, recommending home care of 5,000 parts per million of toothpaste. And if you can't do that, then you would do a 2% um, neutral sodium fluoride mouth rinse. 
So really what they're saying is either as much as you can, or if it's not available, you know, their first line of defense is definitely a varnish followed by a 5,000 parts per million toothpaste. So when we look at that, it really kind of sets in motion. There's a lot of patients in the pra in your practice, I'm sure, that would benefit from a 5,000 parts per million of toothpaste. This is even um, more evident when they were looking at both cavitated and non-cavitated root caries lesions because these recommendations really brought broke down whether it was, you know, what surfaces to. And there was good evidence to support that your patients with root caries really would benefit from this 5,000 parts per million of toothpaste. So we did mention that we were going to talk a little bit about the non-fluoride therapies and the statements on that. So um, when we look at fluoride in general, I know that you're probably in practices where some people really say, I don't want fluoride, et cetera. And, you know, it's, it's a, it puts you in a very difficult position. Um, non, so the ADA came out in 2011 with their first thing about really it's, it's non-fluoride options could provide an extra benefit. Um, but really it needs to be used in addition to fluoridated toothpaste, sealants, varnishes with fluoride, because we really don't have enough evidence. There's not enough science behind all the other um, non-fluoride therapies. And really that's kind of what they came back to and said, you know what, it cannot take the place of fluoride products. So when people ask me that question, I say, I, and, you know, this is the first line of defense. Um, if they want to, you know, there's talk about, um, see, you know, ACP, there's talk about xylitol, but the research on those is very low level. And so we can't just use that alone. So if you want to provide that for your patient in addition, that's fine. But really fluoride needs to be that first line of defense for them. Um, this is another, um, Gordon Christensen comes out with a clinician's report, which I thought was really nice that really, you know, he looked at what was, you know, a, a product that he felt in terms of prevention was something that was indispensable. So, and he really thought this, that Prevident 5000 Booster Plus was, was one of those products by talking to dental professionals, you know, a 5000, it's really an indispensable product because how many of our patients have moderate or high risk caries, almost all of them. How many have a crown or, or restorations in their mouth or some trying to control their caries incidents? Quite a few. So this was kind of nice to see that, you know what, this is something that really we should think about as being a definitely first line of defense for our patients. So let's take a look. Um, we're gonna take a look at fluoride products and then we're gonna kind of put this together to see okay, what does this mean? How can I use this? And how do I get this caries risk and pull this all together? So we're going to briefly talk a little bit about some of the products. And um, when I was putting this together, I, I find that I get a, a few of my counterparts say, well, why do you talk about all these different ones? Because we have different um, prevalent products, but, it, but I like to tell a little bit about the history of it. So um, Prevident 5000 gel was really our first generation of 5000 parts per million of fluoride. So this, this one has been around for probably since uh, 1990. Um, and that was working in clinical practice. I remember this is what we gave people and we did a lot of fluoride trays. And this was something that we used, you know, after a patient with brush and floss, we would hope that they would use this. So when we look at the research here, you know, it helps prevent decay. It arrests up to 91% of root caries and it's safe for ceramic restoration. So this kind of is some of the research that we look back at that ADA clinical practice guidelines that they were talking about. You know, this is pretty significant when we think of our patients with root caries. I mean, we have patients that are, our patient, our patient population is getting older. Um, we have a lot of recession they're more likely to have caries. And this is a really good product. 5,000 parts per million is very effective for root caries. So then we went to our next generation. And for me, the reason was patient compliance. I mean, we're asking them to brush, floss, and then brush again. And we know how difficult that can be. 
So this kind of took that extra step and combined them. So here we have the 5,000 parts per million, the 1.1% sodium fluoride, and it, with the really significant remineralization and caries in three months in one step. So we really kind of took their protocol and their prevention, you know, routine and kind of shrunk it down a little bit. So we were hoping that patients would be more compliant. So then we get into what we call our third generation. This is our Prevident 5000 Booster Plus, our booster line. And this is 5000 parts per million, again, of fluoride, 1.1% neutral sodium fluoride. This has fluoroguard technology in it and tricalcium phosphate. So when we talk about fluoride technology, fluoroguard technology, what I like to think about is this technology actually shifts the pH slightly for better uptake of fluoride because we know we need to kind of shift the pH slightly for uptake of fluoride, and this does it in a neutral sodium um, formula. The other thing about it is this is a liquid gel. So not only does it just, it also disperses 26% faster than the um, Prevident Plus you saw in the first in the previous slide, which is great for those patients in the first 30 seconds, because if they're only brushing for 37 seconds, we're getting that fluoride more into more areas in a shorter amount of time. So we're just thinking ahead, like how do we make it easy for our patients and get that information, get that fluoride to them? This also has tricalcium phosphate in it, which is considered an active ingredient. Um, then along that line, we're thinking, okay, how many of our patients have dry mouth? And all these patients need the 5,000 parts per million. So this is a prevalent dry mouth. So this is for any of your patients that have xerostomia, et cetera. So it is SLL, SLS free. And it has a more of a soothing mint flavor because a lot of times patients with xerostomia have a very difficult time with um, too minty a flavor, so it's pretty mild. Then we have the um, Prevident 5000 Ortho Defense. This is perfect for your patients that are you know, in ortho. It prevents white spots, lesions before they start. If you're doing any patients with Invisalign, it's really, a, um, you know, you want your patients using some kind of um, 5,000 parts per million of fluoride because you don't want those white spot lesions for when they are finished with their ortho treatment. Then we have Prevident 5000 Sensitive. Now, I will tell you that sensitivity is a big problem with patients, and we have lots of patients with dentin hypersensitivity, many more than you think. I think one in four of patients have some dentin hypersensitivity. So this not only helps, so that if you have recession and exposed root surfaces, not only do you have the fluoride to help with caries, but you have the 5% potassium nitrates to depolarize the nerves. So you kind of have, this is called a dual active um, prescription product. And then we have our Enamel Protect, which is definitely something we're seeing a lot of in terms of erosion. And I think this goes back to a little bit of what I talked about with the diet. I mean, we definitely have a much more acidic diet than, than we used to have. And, you know, even people who are like vegetarians eating a lot of citrus fruit. So, and many of these patients who have erosion, not only have loss of enamel, but then they sometimes have dentin hypersensitivity. So this particular product is a 1.1% sodium fluoride, and it also has potassium nitrate. Now, the nice thing about this line is it really is indication-based. And we are in a, in a time where patients are looking for things that are very patient-centric. So they want to know that it's definitely, a, that, you know, it's not one size fits all. What are you giving me that really is tailored to my situation and what I need? So this is um, our fluoride varnish, which is ready to use. This is... Um, 5% sodium fluoride, 22,600 parts per million, coming in a variety of flavors. And I, I hope that you will find that the nice thing about this is it goes on really easy. It has good fluoride release, according to the ADA's fluoride release um, studies. And that um, in your practice, you really will turn to varnish because I think that really is probably providing the best fluoride 
um, in-office treatment for your patients. And so now we're gonna talk a little bit about advantages of dispensing fluoride, prescription fluorides for patient and dental professional. And, I'm, and I kind of go back to the, what I, the story I was telling you in my practice that we worked as that was part of a, you know, when you left, you got your first Prevident 5000. And at the time, that was Prevident 5000 plus because we didn't have the liquid gels at the time. And, and the reason was it really made the patient realize that it was something that we strongly recommended, strongly encouraged, and we wanted them to continue on that regimen because otherwise it was less likely as soon as they had to fill a prescription, it was one extra step. Um, they, and the other thing is they will probably end up at the pharmacy getting a generic unless you write down that it will not be substituted. Um, it's many times more cost effective for the patient. And what we always did is we gave them a choice. You know, the first one they got the Prevident um, in the office when they left. And after that, if they wanted a prescription, we'd do that. But many times they would come back and get that um, from the office. And the other piece I liked about it is it kind of showed me that they were using it. If they didn't, if I, if they gave them some and they never came back and got more, it kind of showed me they weren't using it. So then when they'd come back and they would say, oh, you know, I have more cavities, you really could say, well, you know, this is only supposed to last this amount of time. You really couldn't know whether they're doing follow through or not. The other thing that it could be is a really income generator. In a time like this where we're looking at the bottom line, is there a way we could generate a little extra income? So on this table, we have um, a little bit about you know, sales per unit um, and how much the unit price is. So let's say if you're not buying as many, it's $14.49. If you sell it for $20, you're making a profit of $5.51 and a yearly profit of $1,100. Well, what's interesting is that if a patient goes to the pharmacy, especially if it's not covered by any their um, health insurance, they're going to be paying anywhere between $25 and $35 for that particular product. So what we're trying to do is a way to make it beneficial to the office, but also beneficial to your patient and a convenience and much more convenient for them. So um, the other thing I, I think is super important is always um, code for the insurance. Prevent. Some might pay for it, but it's important to definitely um, code for it. And also this kind of goes along with the carries risk assessment report and documentation. Um, even though you can't really officially charge for it in some areas, some insurance companies will let you. It's always important to document that they're high risk for carries. That then allows you to, that patient might then get the dental benefit for the varnish. They might get reimbursed for the Prevident. Um, it just depends on their on their benefit package. But it's very important that we always code for it to make sure that people are aware that it's been done. And then if you need to write a prescription, um, these are the, you know, the um, NDC codes and also, you know, dispense as written. Um, you can order free prescription pads for from us. Um, which makes it easier, but I think most of them are now kind of going to electronic anyway. But definitely you can put down do not substitute, but I will say certain states um, still mandate generic, whether you say that or not, depending on the program and the insurance. So something to think about, but this is um, a slide that if you wanna take a picture of, is kind of nice to have. So let's talk a little bit. So we've kind of done just a brief, yeah, we, we still have patients with caries. Um, are we doing a risk assessment? I think that is probably super important to think about incorporating into your practice. Um, we've talked about fluoride, we've talked about what the uh, science is here. So now let's talk a little bit about how we put this into action in your practice. So do you have a clinical protocol and what does it look like? I think the first thing and the one thing that really makes it difficult with patients and kind of managing their caries is everyone being on the same page. So I always like to say, okay, once you have 
you're doing a risk assessment and you decide you need to make some really good decisions. What are our first line of defense? If a patient's moderate, what are we recommending? Are we really asking what kind of toothpaste they're, they're, they're using? Does it have fluoride in it? That would be kind of the first question. Um, are they rinsing? Is it a fluoride rinse? What kind of rinse is it? How much fluoride, understanding how much they're getting. And if they're not really having enough fluoride and they're still having caries, then we need to do kind of, what are we adding on? Is it, if they're moderate, are we doing a varnish in office? Are we sending them home with some Prevident 5000? Is that the first line of defense? What are we doing with them? What is our office protocol so that everyone's speaking the same language and on the same page so that you can really say to the patient and to anyone else who says to you, you know, if you had to with a board of dental examiners, if you had to back up and document, we did a caries risk assessment. Here's what we recommended. Here's our protocol. Always good things to have because those are things that really will allow you to monitor the outcomes. Is that particular therapy working for this patient? How do you know if you haven't monitored and written it down? And then when I think of this, I think about the great thing about getting everyone on the same page, but also having a good risk assessment and a good protocol is that it's very predictive. I mean, you can predict, as soon as you see that risk assessment, you can predict what their risk is. How are we gonna help them? We can then really put together a good preventive plan for them that makes sense for that patient. We can make it personalized. Like I said, it's, we are in an environment where people want patient-centric, very personalized recommendations. It's not one size fits all. And then it really gives them ownership of their condition. I mean, I, I do not want my patients coming back saying, why do I keep getting cavities? Because suddenly that puts the ownership on me. I want them participating early. I want them owning what happens in their mouth. They'll be the first ones to say, you know what? I didn't use the stuff I recommended. I didn't, you know, last time I decided I didn't want to do the fluoride varnish because my insurance didn't cover it, but I'd still have cavities. I really do want that this time because I know it's a value to me. It is a benefit to me and it will help with my caries risk. So what's next? I always like to stop and say, you know, we just listened to this. Is there one thing or two things that you might do differently in your practice tomorrow in terms of caries prevention for your patient? I want you to think about what can I do differently in my practice? How will it impact my patients? And, and how as a team can we really move forward and put caries risk uh, assessment into motion? Any questions for me? Yes, I believe we have a couple. Okay, great. Um, Thank you. The first one was, can you share the code again? I believe it was a, a caries code. Sure. For caries risk assessment? Yes, yes, please. Um, and while you're pulling that up, we have another question here that says, when recommending Prevident 5000 toothpaste, do you recommend mm -hmm. they not rinse after using the toothpaste? So, so usually I say don't rinse. I mean, I think the directions say no, don't rinse because the longer it's there, the better. Um, but the nice thing is with the Prevident booster, when I talked about how quickly they um, the uptake is in the first 30 seconds. I'm not as concerned because that way they're at least, um, it disperses faster. It's D0603. I'll put that back. Oops, it keeps going away quickly. Perfect. And then do you recommend Prevident two times a day for high-risk patients? So I leave that to the dental professional. I mean, if they're, I, I do want them brushing twice a day. If they're high risk, it, I, in my practice, I would say every time you brush, use it because the more often that you keep that uh, fluoride reservoir, you know, available and they're having a lot of acidic challenges, it probably doesn't hurt. The research was done though. Any of the research we've done was once a day, but 
as a dental professional, that is definitely your decision. And if you think the patient would benefit, absolutely. There's no harm in doing it twice a day. All right. I've only got one question left. So if anyone has any questions, feel free to throw them in the chat or Q&A and we'll answer them. Otherwise, we'll get a couple minutes back in our days here. Uh, okay. the next question is, how effective is the varnish for proximal caries? So what you're creating with any varnish is, is a fluoride reservoir. So anytime that shift in pH and those hydroxy appetite crystals come out, they form back as fluoride appetite. So it's just as effective for interproximal as smooth, you know, any smooth surface carries. Isn't it true the instructions after giving the varnish there is no eating for six hours? Yes. But most of them, it's, it's usually no eating or drinking something, but I think it also says um, nothing hard or hot. I, I'm just going to be, I mean, it says that, but I have to be honest, all our patients are going to do it. So I always say, you, you tell them that and you know, they're probably not going to do it, but you've created, you know, you're still also talking about a very high concentration of, of varnish, of fluoride. And how is the varnish applied? Is it, or use it in office or at home? It's in office and you you use it. It's actually a, a little uh, brush. You briefly dry the, the teeth. You don't desiccate the area, just dry it. And then you do swipes. And I usually recommend that you do the maxilla first because saliva actually is active. I mean, varnish is activated by saliva. So a lot of times people say, oh, my it clumps. Well, it clumps because you've had it in the mouth with saliva and then you put it in, back in the varnish. So I usually say, take some out, swipe it, wipe it on the gauze. I usually do the uh, facial of the maxilla first and then the lingual and then the facial, the mandible, and then the lingual mandible, because that's where the most saliva is. Is RX fluoride toothpaste safe during pregnancy? I, I haven't really, you know, that's not something that they actually do studies on on pregnant women. So I, I can't really, you know, I would say probably I wouldn't use it without um, physicians. Um, okay, because it's not something people don't do research on um, things like that on pregnant people, women. Uh, I just had a comment here that says our office prefers the foam still due to waiting only 30 minutes to eat. If you go back to the ADA um, study on foams, the, the only problem with the foam is you can't measure it. It has to be four minutes. And they really, you know, when you look at the extra, they couldn't extrapolate any good science behind it. So they're all recommending the gel versus the foam on that. So, but it's, it's your preference, but definitely make sure you have a, you have, you measure it and do the four minutes. And then have a question here. Not sure if you'll be able to answer it, but I'll try you. Okay. Uh, what do offices typically charge for D9630? I don't know the answer to that. I really don't. Uh, looks like we got one more question here. Okay. Is, there, is there any age restrictions for the products that you shared with us today? Yes, some of them. Uh, the Prevident uh, 5000 is um, over the age of six just because of ingestion. Um, it, supervision always for those things. Um, and varnish can be used. Um, the American um, Academy of Pediatric Dentists recommends varnish for all children. So. There's no age restriction on that. Great. Thank you for answering those questions. Um, if anyone has additional questions about today's topic, please feel free to email us at webinars at henryshine.com. Additionally, if anyone is interested in attending future Henry Shine webinars, I encourage you to visit henryshinedental.com slash webinars for our upcoming schedule. As a thank you for attending today, everyone will receive the recording of this webinar via email next week. Uh, actually it's like, we got a couple more questions here. Um, okay. Oh, can you, what, what's the code again? Someone needs the code. Um, 0603. 0603. All right. Mm -hmm. Put that in the and chat for everyone. Uh, cool. Uh, Diane, unless you have anything else, I think we're, we're good. To I wrap think we're good. Now. Well, thank you so much. No problem. Thank, thank you. Thank you everyone. Have a great weekend.